Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. The international break is halfway through. We're almost through it. Um, isn't it great fun? Um, hey, well, we've got to see Harry Kane scoring a hat-trick. Yes, of course, it was against, you know, not the, the greatest opposition in the world, but I think for Tottenham it's a good thing. Um, confidence building, the perfect hat-trick, left foot, right foot, header, um, and the third goal. Actually, the second goal was a lovely strike as well, but the third goal was the technique was beautiful. That was kind of prime Kane. Um, so hopefully that that's, you know, I know we've said this before when he scored the hat-trick in the Europa Conference League, but hopefully this will give him some... Um, just a bit of a boost, you know. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before what I'm going to crack on with a, a Spurs Q&A today. I promised to do one before and then got COVID, which kind of was feeling too rough to do it. And then I couldn't really fit it in. Um, but yeah, I've got various questions that you guys have put in the comments from my last video, which I'm going to try and plow through. But a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I realised after I did the little video that after 58 minutes, I managed to not mention at any point during the video that Oliver Skip was uh, suspended for this um, for this weekend's game against Leeds. Um, hopefully, I haven't looked at the questions yet. I'm going to do it off the cuff. So hopefully some of the questions maybe will lead me into talking about what midfield setup they might have against Leeds uh, with Skippy out. Other bits of housekeeping, injury news. Um, Sonny picked up a little bit of a knock, um, but... I think he's supposed to be fine to play uh, South Korea's second game. There are the excellent Sung Mo Lee, who's a, a colleague of mine who covers all things South Korean football. He sent me a quote that's essentially Sonny just saying it's not serious. Just wanted to, just felt it wasn't worth risking it doing a training session and, and just potentially aggravating anything. Um, and he's doing all the media duties ahead of their game against Iraq. So hopefully um, he'll be fine. Pierre Emil Hoybier is the other one. Um, Obviously, if you remember, he got that rather unpleasant kind of challenge, the Mason Holgate one um, that got him sent off in the Everton game. And, yeah, he was still called up by Denmark, Hoybier, but he was kind of on the proviso. He wasn't he wasn't going to play against the Faroe Islands in the first game, and now they've decided he's not going to play against Scotland either in the second. Um, I've spoken to a couple of Danish journos that cover the national team, and they said, from what they can gather, it doesn't appear to be a serious thing just that Denmark have already qualified for the World Cup, so there was no need to potentially risk him. Um, so he's come back. So hopefully that works out for Tottenham, and he's got a full two weeks to... or well, he have had a full two weeks to rest and recover. Um, and hopefully it's nothing more than that, because obviously Skippy out as well. Um, that make things a little bit difficult if Hoybier was out as well. So I think that's all the housekeeping. Oh, I just wanted to say... Um, I mentioned last week at the start of the video, obviously I'd just come back from Lisbon and uh, I started to go on about Lisbon and I said, oh no, actually, we'll save this. Maybe I'm jokingly kind of said, I'll do a, uh, maybe I'll do other travel videos one day and different kind of thing. And people very kindly underneath said, oh yeah, no, we'd watch that. Um, which I mentioned to my wife, which I probably shouldn't have because she then got very excited about the prospect of uh, travelling the world and doing videos and stuff like that. I think she's pretty much mapped out our next 20 years uh, and what we're doing, but uh, Tottenham Hotspur first, we've got lots and lots to talk about before I could even think about doing that sort of thing, as cool as it would be. Uh, so yeah, let's get into the Spurs q and I'm going to rattle through as many as I can. As I said, I'm kind of doing this blind, I'm not, I haven't looked at them before, I haven't kind of prepared anything, so that kind of, um, it'll either make it very exciting, or it'll make it really rubbish, because you'll get me going, ooh, ooh, for a while while I try and think about what the answers are. Um, but hey, let's crack on. I'm going to try and fit as many as I can into this because um, there's lots of. Re I did remember seeing some kind of pinging up on my notifications, and there were some quite funny ones as well as uh, as good ones. But um, I've forgotten pretty much all of them. Uh, so start off. Twan fifty five asks Ali. I have a question that I bet is one a lot of people's on a lot of people's minds, and here it is: How many players at Spurs or in the Premier League are vaccinated? I know you can't give out who is vaccinated, and quite possibly you have no little idea. But could you talk a bit about it? Uh, and it's a really, really long, 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 long question where he talks about um, not, um, you know, being vaccinated, not getting COVID, things like that, and whether they have to do it and all this. Um, what I would say is, just before, ironically, I got COVID, I remember the Premier League put out an email with the stats then. So that was, what was that, six, seven weeks ago now? Um, and I remember the figures were quite high. It was something like, I've been in the 80s, 80%. It's a long... I can't remember. My brain's been scrambled since then. 
Um, but I remember putting it out and people on Twitter saying, well, that's higher than the average in like in the UK. That's really good. Um, again, you know, it's, it's down to people's personal choice, whatever you think about various things. Um, I, I do know pretty much the situation at Tottenham, but like who and the various ones who haven't and all that. And it's, but it's something I'd never really put out there because it's, um, it's everyone's choice. It's a medical thing. You know, it's, it's confidentiality, all of this sort of stuff. Um, you know, we had the incident recently, didn't we, with a couple of positive cases um, at Spurs that ended up being false positives and, you know, everyone went out with names and stuff. And the reason I didn't was exactly why, because what happened it ended up that it wasn't the case. Um, so you can't really, it's not something that obviously I'd ever go into. Um, all I'd say is obviously the latter stuff it kind of talks about people not getting COVID if they got vaccinated. It, obviously, of course, it gives you a better chance of not getting it. Personally, I had both jabs and, and still got it. I think my hope with the vaccination was that it stopped anyone in my family getting it really seriously um, when we got it. Um, but yeah, obviously, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't 100% protect you from not getting it. So yeah, to, to kind of assume that, um, I think what I'm trying to say is, I think there's a kind of a, almost a, an element in the rest of this question about, you know, people, you know, if they're, they're going to get it, it's because they haven't got it. But whereas you can still get it as well. It's, you know, it's it's not foolproof in that. It just hopefully protects you from getting it really rubbishly. But there's a whole other thing. That's nah, a whole other thing. And this is not to start a whole vaccination debate or anything at all like that because, you know, this is about Tom and that's what we're going to talk about. So next question. Jonathan Murphy asks, um, with Christmas nearing, what Spurs books could you recommend? I've always enjoyed Julie Welch's Biography of Spurs and will read her new 2021 edition for sure. Julie Welsh is one of the loveliest ladies I've ever um, come across. She is fantastic. She's incredible. Look her up on the internet. Look at her history and what she's done and what she's achieved. She is absolutely incredible. I've been very fortunate to, um, in the last year or so, um, she's interviewed me a couple of times over, over Zoom. Unfortunately, I'd love to meet her in person, but over Zoom. Um, for this 2021 edition of uh, the biography of Spurs, which I'm absolutely honoured to uh, hopefully be a part of if I've made the cut. Um, she's just fantastic, honestly. It's an absolute inspiration to not only female journalists who are kind of making their way through it, but just all journalists. She's just incredible. There's, you know, It's not about gender at all. She's just incredible at what she does. So, honestly... If you haven't read the original, wait for the, the new one to come out if it hasn't already. I think she was hopefully going to send me a copy, which I'm ecstatic to read um, because she's awesome. Um, myself, I, you know, The Glory Game, that Hunter Davies book was just, I think I'll put it, I'm just going to have a look, put it up on the shelf there somewhere. Um, it's, sorry to get the top of my head so close to the camera. Um, it's brilliant, honestly. It's, it's one of those books that not only gives you an incredible insight, but it, it's, it doesn't really date either. It's kind of timeless. Um, yes, of course, football is very different and the access is very different now. But, you know, in, in a dream world, I would love to do something like that. It'd be so good. You know, nowadays, you're lucky if you maybe spend, uh, if you're going to get uh, to talk to a player, obviously, especially with COVID restrictions and everything. But to actually spend as much time as Hunter Davies did, honestly, it's one of the best football books out there it really is so that's probably that's probably the one that kind of stands out to me about Spurs you know loads of biographies out there as well and autobiographies from various players that are very good but if I'm talking about the one Spurs bit that will just bang straight into my mind it's that um what else we got Sean Geary asks hi Alistair I hope you had a nice holiday my question is do you think Conte could use Delhi as one of his wing backs if I'm honest, probably not. I know he's got a history of converting wing backs. I'd say probably the two that if he is going to convert anyone that spring to mind would probably be Lucas or Bergvein. I don't think Delhi playing out wide and slinging in crosses probably getting the best out of Delhi Alley. Um, I'm intrigued to see what happens with Delhi. Um, again, I hope I'm not treading on the toes of a question that's to come, but I'm. In the Conte formation, I, just, I struggle to see what his place is unless. He also goes down the Nuno route of kind of having him as a box-to-box -box midfielder, whether he does that. But in the 3-4-3, three, three, 
you know, it's tough to see where he, he played unless you played him alongside a Hoybier or a Skip. Um, it doesn't really fit any of the roles up front in the three. If you go to a 3 4 1 2, he could potentially play in the role behind Kane or, um, sorry, behind, well, it would be Kane and Son for now. Um, but personally, I don't think he's enough of a playmaker to play that role. Ironically, if you were going to play with a two up front, that's probably where Delhi would be best playing off of Kane, where he was best, you know, in, the, in his kind of, I say prime, it's sad to say his prime when he's only 25 now, and hopefully he gets back to a prime, but or, or a new prime. Um, but yeah, I think um, Sonny's obviously has got that uh, tied up, that second striker spot. But um, And I think Spurs will bring in another striker as well. So yeah, I'm really intrigued to see what he does with Delhi. He's, um, you know, Conte's already said the door's not closed at all for him. It's, it's now a fresh slate for everyone, as all new managers say. So this will be a big two weeks for Delhi to have worked with him kind of closely. And yeah, we'll see exactly what he what he feels he can do with, with Delhi. Next one, Josh Morse asks, if you had to pick a hybrid player with a current Spurs player and a former Spurs, Spurs player, who would they be and why? Wow. That, that is a tough question. Crikey. See, this is why I should have looked at the questioners first. Um, I'm going to pick Tongi as the current one because you know my affection for Tongi, despite the fact that He's yet to kind of show it on a consistent basis. Although what I would say about Tongi, I was told this week, if you haven't seen my articles, that um, he's apparently, this season thus far, has been in the best shape of his Spurs career. I put that out and a lot of people went, oh, the Conte effect. And I actually wasn't talking about Conte. I was talking about before that. Um, so, you know, you've probably got to give credit to Nuno and Tongi himself that, yeah, in the Newcastle game, he ran more than any other player on the pitch. Um, and, you know, in the last couple of games he started... I think he played 90 minutes against Newcastle, played 90 minutes against Wolves. Was it Wolves in the Carabao Cup as well? Um, you know, he's starting to get he's starting to get those fitness levels up there. It's just a shame almost in Conte's first couple of games, he didn't play much. He just came off the bench for kind of two cameos. Um, but yeah, these two weeks, at least he'll now have that foundation for the incredible demands that Conte will put on them fitness-wise. So, uh, sorry, we're a bit off tangent there. So, Tongi, um, but with... The consistency of who should we go for? Like a Luka Modric, maybe? Or with maybe maybe Musa Dembele. Let's do that. God, can you imagine? Yeah, yeah, let's go for that. Let's go for that. There's plenty of previous ones from, from further back I could have gone with. But actually, if I think about it, if you get Tongi with his incredible skills and ability also in the final third, and you mix him with Musa Dembele. And his strength and consistency and fitness, um, obviously later on became a bit injury prone, but or he had a struggle, didn't he? I can't remember what the injury was. It was just this injury that he always kind of carried. We used to see him limping around the mix zone afterwards. But yeah, so if you could merge on Dembele and Dembele, that would be one of the best players to have probably played in the Premier League ever. Um, yeah, I'm going to go for that. I'm going to go for that. We got there in the end. Um, what else we got? Um, Greg says, Ali, I'd love to hear some more details about Conte's 18-month contract. I find it hard to get excited when it's so short-term. Yeah, I'm surprised at that one. People, As in people getting kind of worried about it. Well, first off, Conte does, where the circumstances may be the cause of it, but he is a manager who doesn't stay too long at clubs. His average is about two years. But what I would say about that, the 18-month contract, it was made quite clear by Spurs, we knew it anyway, that the contract has an option for another year anyway. So it is essentially, you know, it's a two-and-a-half-year contract. Um, you know, because I think, I'm pretty sure the club would have that option. Pretty much always options are favoured in the club, for the club to take. So, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I'd, I'd, I'd say, as I said before, I'll be excited about what Conte can do in the now. That's what he's here for. Um, I think next season will be his real kind of big season. Um, this season is very much about understanding the club, understanding the players, and hopefully shaping the squad to what he wants it to be. And then next season, and I think he says this at every club he goes to, in his first season maybe isn't always the one that's going to be the biggie, uh, although sometimes it is. Um, it's more about building for the first full set, especially 
I think this is his first time since his early jobs that he's coming in mid-season. So, no, I wouldn't be too worried about that, to be honest. Um, there's another question about Ali, but I've kind of just answered that. So, sorry, Graham McKean there. You're talking about Ali. Um, so, I'm going to give you a name check anyway. Um, K-Mac asks, since you started covering Spurs during the Poch era, what has been one of your favourite memories that few of us will have heard of? Obviously, the Champions League nights in Amsterdam and Barcelona would be good ones, but there are, are there any personal memories for you that are worth sharing? Oh, man, I wish I'd seen these questions before. So I could have a proper rack through my brains. Um, I am going to use... Well, on a personal level, and I always say this, so it's, it's not kind of shocking stuff, but the final game at White Hart Lane was incredible. It's probably... I'm a bit of a robot. I wouldn't say I'm the most emotional man in the world ever. Um, but that's the closest I've really felt to being emotional covering a football match was that last game of White Hart Lane. I think a lot of the, the fact that, you know, it was the ground that my dad would take me to as a kid. So White Hart Lane always, for me, reminded me of my dad, who's, you know, he's no longer with us nowadays. So I think, yeah, that felt like a real closing of a chapter. Um, and personally... Just going afterwards, watching the, you know, Poch and the staff going out onto the pitch. And then when Poch came through for his press conference, all of his um, backroom staff, you know, the three key men, uh, Miguel, Tony and uh, Jesus, were all, they all came out and they all asked, they essentially asked us all to take photos of them standing in a little press conference room, which when you look back now and you've kind of got the giant room at the new stadium for press conferences and the very big room as well at Hotspur Way, the old... White Hart Lane press conference room was this little dark thing. It was a really funny little press conference room. And uh, now I remember them having that little moment to themselves. And uh, well, I said to themselves, with us, the media, and then with them to themselves on the pitch. Um, that was lovely. And then, yeah, I always have this funny little moment with the with the Amsterdam night with Lucas Moura's hat-trick where just kind of in a daze. I've told the story a million times about the, all the Ajax fans getting very angry and throwing all their beer down on the journalists because they were right above the press area. Um, but after that, after it was all done, it was time to walk down to the press conferences. I um, I was just walking one way and Jermaine Genius was coming the other way. And I've never, ever spoken to him other than this little moment. And I just kind of, I think we were both in a daze. And I just looked at him and I said, that wasn't too shabby, was it? And he just went, it certainly was not. And we just kind of both went our different ways. It's probably something that he'll never remember in a million years. But just for me in that moment, it was very surreal. This player that I'd kind of watched, you know, before I became a, a Spurs journalist and who clearly is a big part of, you know, punditry and everything now. And he's very good at it. Um, and just uh, just had that little moment. It was almost like the eye of the storm. You know, everything had just gone crazy. And we just had this really calm moment before we went down and did all the press conference stuff, which was obviously, it was all manic again. Um, and yeah, so those are my two kind of memory things. Um, what else we got here? Um, oh, interesting one. Dennis Martin asks, do you think Oliver Skip could be transformed into a number 10? As you stated, he can pass the ball. Personally, I don't think that's where his future is held, um, is going to be. He he has got lovely vision. You know, I get a lot of people have kind of labelled him this sideways passer. I think he does what is right for the team in the moment a lot. And obviously, but as his confidence builds, as being a kind of, I think he will be a key member of that team, you'll see more and more of what I have seen over the years for the academy. You see little glimpses of it. Like, I remember in pre-season, he played this incredible half-volleyed pass crossfield ball, which was, I can't remember what game it was. It was one where I think he came on at, I think he went off at half time. It was one of his first ones back. It was brilliant. And he's done a few of that. Honestly, he does. He's very good at that. But I think he just leaves it to Hoybier now. I think he is expected to be the one that gets up the pitch and all of that. And he just will play the safer balls. But he can do it. But yeah, as far as going over number 10, I don't think so. I think you'd be negating a lot of the good stuff he does in terms of anticipation, interceptions, tackling at the back. Um, he's going to be a He's going to be a player. Um Let's have a look. Someone tell me I'm pronouncing Doherty wrong. Oh, yeah, I've been saying Doherty, and it's more Doherty. Doherty. Again, like Paratici, it's going to take me a long time to change to that. So, sorry. Um, let's have a look. 
What next? Conversion season has arrived, says Partha. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's really a question. Um, it's quite funny, though. Um, oh, Jay Bizzlebrand is not a fan of Oskip. Says he's been at fault for countless goals and looks miles off the pace. And, uh, you know my opinions on Oliver Skip, so there's no point in going on a long thing about that. Um, Keon, ah, yes, Keon Atete is from Knox County. I said that last week. I said about... Um, Keon Atete, who's doing very, very well on his loan spell at the moment at Northampton Town. I could not remember where Spurs got him from. It was Notts County. Um, Alan Bennett asked what's going on with naming rights. He's still nothing really on that at the moment. Um, you know, uh, Todd Klein, the sponsorship, sorry, sorry, the chief financial officer, that's one of his tasks to do. But I think maybe Spurs have come out of that desperate period now where maybe if they were going to make a desperate move, they'd do it then. Um, obviously they've sorted out Getir doing the whole training ground sponsorship uh, or training kit sponsorship and that'll have brought in a fair bit of money um, I think they're just trying to get it right this one because obviously it's something that's going to be associated with the stadium for like probably you're likely to do like a 20 year deal aren't you um, so they just want to make sure it's the right one for the right money um, and obviously the more NFL games they play there you get more exposure you get in America so then you get American ones coming in Premier League obviously is massive itself probably elsewhere um, but yeah I, I must admit it's a weird one I don't, I don't understand why it's taken this long I know COVID and the pandemic obviously has prolonged everything but um, yeah, I'd hope we see some I'm going to do some digging around on that in the next couple of weeks and see what's going on Jam Jams, Jams Jams, ask, why are we not finding a Christian Eriksen replacement? We need creativity. Preaching to the converted, Jams Jams. I don't know. I don't know. Um, for me, you know, you might remember me saying when I spoke about the end of the transfer window in the summer, I felt it was the one thing they didn't really go for. Unless they just feel that Onda Melin Lo Celso can provide that. Um, you know, Hill as well, Brian Hill who um, hopefully, I think I saw him in some training photos, so hopefully he's kind of on his way back as well. He might be the one that could lay a claim for that number 10 spot as well in the Conte system. I'm fascinated to see how he uses him, because I think I said this last time, we've now gone from having huge amounts of wingers at Spurs into a formation that doesn't really use wingers. So the most adaptable ones are going to be the ones that thrive. Um, and Hill, you know, who knows? But I hope Spurs look for another kind of... I mean... <sighs> Ericsson is a bit lightning in a bottle. He is um, a playmaker who also ran more than any other player on the pitch. And that's very rare. He wasn't particularly great at tackling, but he was very good at pressing and harassing and, and forcing mistakes. Um, and that, again, is not something you get with a lot of top creative playmakers that you think of. But I do wonder whether that's something they'll look to address next summer rather than January. But um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what the focus is. This is the thing. I don't know, again, in my trip on a question, um, tread on the toes of a question that um, comes later, but Conte for now, this is his period. I see all these transfer stories. I see this person, that person. Oh, I suppose Conte has demanded this person to come in. And it's a bit like, we're still in early November. Um, you know, I mean, what are we, what is the date? 15th, sorry, mid, mid-November. So he's still got what we, a month and a half till the January transfer window even opens. He's got to assess his squad. You know, I was told last week, was it last week? Last week? Yeah, I think it was towards the end of last week. They haven't actually discussed transfers yet with Conte, the club. Um, you know, I'm sure, and people said this very quickly, I wrote, I'm sure when they were kind of bringing him in, there would have been some talk about ideas and what he would like and what their plans were and finances. But I'm led to believe that he is, you know, he's very aware of the situation at Tottenham. Um, I don't think there's huge amounts of money to throw around in January at all. I think there maybe would have to be a sale or two to help facilitate that. Because, um, yes, while Spurs are financially stable compared to where they were, they're still they're still getting back to that ground um, you know, in terms of getting all the events on, bringing in the money. All these events that people don't like, they do actually bring in money to the club to be able to put into the football club. Um, so, yeah, I'm really intrigued to see what January kind of holds for him because... You know, it's Spurs clearly do need the squad shaping to his demands. There's no getting away from that. And he will work out over the next month and a half exactly what he needs. 
Um, but, you know, it's Antonio Conte. Antonio Conte doesn't go into seasons with football clubs just expecting to, oh yeah, whatever you do is good for me. He's a guy that demand, is very demanding um, and clearly that's been a good thing in terms of his career because he has won a lot of stuff and he is a, one of the world's top managers. But I just wonder how Tottenham, you know, I just really would have loved to be a fly on the wall on those meetings. Like I say, I'm told that he's fully aware of exactly what the limitations are at Tottenham and what can and can't be done in the coming transfer windows. Um, but I just wonder whether we get into January, I don't know, say Kane does pick up a little injury and, or Son's not available or something, and then Spurs are struggling with no real striker up front. I wonder whether, like Mourinho, you'll just see him starting to go like, oh, what is happening here? And and if it's Conte, it often leads to fireworks. So, um, yeah, sorry, a bit away from the actual question was about Christian Eriksen replacement. But, yeah, I'm really intrigued to see what the January window brings because I think it's going to be a fascinating study of Conte and Tottenham and where they're at in this new era. Um, if Conte is backed in January in the summer, what do you feel Tottenham can achieve during his 18-month contract? Says Elvis G. Well, I think history tells us what Conte can do. If he's backed... I think Tottenham will be right back up there and, and challenging for things. Um, you know, it's one of those. You can't definitively say, oh, they will do this, they will do that, because there's a lot of strong teams in the Premier League right now. But certainly, you know, remember Mourinho in his first press conference said, oh, next season we'll have Tottenham challenging at the top of the league, uh, challenging for the title. You know, they weren't, but I think if Conte certainly was backed and, you know, Mourinho's supporters may well say that he wasn't back to the degree that he needed to be in certain positions, um, primarily centre-back, I guess. Um, but yeah, so if Conte's backed, he is one of the best, you know, and the way the players are already talking about him and gushing about his training sessions and how hard they are, but how they can already feel themselves improving. You know, the sky could be the limit, honestly, if he's backed. Um, so that, that's not a question... Sam Flood asked, do you think Hugo Lloris will be given a contract extension? I think it's all on Hugo, quite frankly. I think he's started the season again very consistently, as I felt he was last season. Um, I'd be stunned if he continues in this way that the club don't offer him an extension, but then it's down to Hugo and whether he wants to stick around. His family obviously would be very settled here, but I know he had hopes, I think he said it before, of playing in um, back in France before he retires. And I think there was also talk about potentially an MLS uh, move at one point. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I would I think while he's still playing at this level, I think it would be a mistake from Spurs if they don't. Um, I think he's a good goalkeeper. I think he gets a lot of unfair flack because of sometimes the way he's asked to play. But I actually think as a goalkeeper, some of the stuff he does is incredible. Uh, so, yeah, one to keep an eye on, really. I mean, you know, he's not a player that really needs to prove himself. But, obviously, it's... When you're talking about a player in their, you know, pretty in their mid-30s uh, or in their mid-30s. Um, and Spurs are a club that don't normally give players over 30 a certain amount of years on their contract. Um, I think Aldo Veril, they broke that with. and I think it was Sissoko that actually broke that with. Before that, it had only been maybe a year, two-year contracts. Um so, yeah, it's, it's about both sides being happy, I guess, with it. Um, wow, that's a whole comment entirely in capital letters. I, I don't... Sorry, I can't even understand what that says. It's a very long one. Um, the question that is... Uh, Stuart Morgan says, any news on the goalkeeping coach? No, do you know what? That's my bad. That was something I was going to chase up this week and I haven't done it yet um, no they haven't, I've seen that um, oh my goodness his name's gone out of my head completely the academy, uh, Perry Suckling uh, Perry Suckling has been doing um, the academy, uh, he's been working with the, the uh, team as he did when Ryan Mason took care, take a charge um, he seems to have been working all the photos I've seen, he's there so, yeah, it's a surprising one, that. I don't know why that hasn't been announced yet. Um, but I will. I'll get on that. I'll get an answer for you on that. Anything I can't answer, I will um, I will try and find out for you. Um, 
For the Q&A, Dan asks... Oh, yeah, did I actually say you asked that? Stuart Morgan. Yes, I think I did. Dan says, for the Q&A, what realistic transfer targets would you like to see come in for January and why do you think they'll be the ones to make the difference under a Conte Tottenham side? Do you know what? I'm sorry this is a really boring answer, but it's absolutely not who I would want to come in. The key thing is who Conte will want to come in and it's who... You know, he may have come in with thoughts of previous players or players that he saw in Serie A or anyone that he wants to come in in January or the summer... But then after a month and a half or two months, whatever, working with the players, he might decide, well, OK, well, we don't need someone in that area, but actually we probably do need that because that person who I thought maybe fits the system doesn't quite fit it in terms of the Tottenham player and we need to bring in another person. You know, it's no secret that Spurs like Dusan Vlajevic at all. Um, and they, they were trying to trying to get him in the summer and they just couldn't do the deal. Um and I think his contract situation is going down as well. You know, Conte won't have failed to have noticed how good he was last season. Well, he's only 21. He's, he's one of the best young strikers in Europe at the moment. Um, would he fit on? Of course he would. I think he'd be he'd be fantastic. He's a big lad. He's about six foot three or something. He's he's built for the Premier League. Um, left footed as well. <sighs> the key really, it just comes down to that whole debate, doesn't it, of... Son and Kane, for me, is one of the best partnerships you'll get as a strike partnership in the Premier League. Um, if, say, they were able to get Vlajevic, they'd have spent a lot of money, which would be a surprising amount of money for the January window for me, for Tottenham. Um, I feel there's a part, I kind of feel that he's maybe more summer-based as a transfer, but you never know. Sometimes you have to move because another club is, is coming in for them. Um, I think Arsenal were linked, but certainly Charles Watts, who I used to work with, who's covers Arsenal, he's been saying that, that he's not a target for Arsenal. Um, but yeah, you've got to kind of, it's that old debate of if you bring Vlajevic in, yes, he'd be fantastic, you know, you'd inc you'd have incredible competition up there, but would he want to come in as competition, or would he want to swap Fiorentina, where he's playing week in, week out, to come and play for Tottenham, where he's fighting Harry Kane and Son for a spot up front? Whereas, you know, the likes of us will all say, well, no, that's what you need to have. You need to have that in the squad. You need to have competition in every role. You need to have the best players. But unfortunately, if you're that player, why give up the role you've got playing every single week, scoring goals, to come to a place where you're going to battling for a place? Um, and, you know, I think under Nuno, the idea is had they got him, they would have put him up front and Sonny would have been on the left and that would have worked in Nuno's system. Whereas... Um, you know, it would have kind of gone to a more of a like a four four two e type thing, um, or potentially a four one three two. You could have gone to. Whereas with Conte's system with the back three, it makes it very difficult to kind of find another role for Sonny. I mean, yes, you could play him as a number ten, um, which I'm sure Sonny could do. I don't know whether it'd be naturally his best position. You know, I saw someone saying, and it may be a question that comes up about converting him to a wing back. I just think that would be wasting the talent of Sonny if you converted him to a win-back, to be honest. So, yeah, you've got to kind of look at it in that way. Um, and, yeah, foreign player numbers. Ooh, that old subject that I used to go on about. Spurs, just very quickly, they've got three. They could have four spaces if Toby Mole dropped out of the squad. Um, foreign players in the Premier League squad. So they're actually doing fine on that. But, obviously, the weird rule that means that uh, Doherty, um, Roden, Davies and Dyer are all considered foreign in the European squad. Dyer's considered foreign in both because of his years in Portugal. But yeah, so you've got three up extra who in, couldn't need to be foreign players. It means that actually Spurs are exactly on the limit for the European squad. So you'd have to drop someone from the Conference League uh, squad if you wanted to bring someone in, which isn't probably the biggest thing in the world. It's not like telling Juan Foyth you're not going to play in the Champions League because we're bringing in Lucas Moura or something. Um, it's not quite to that level, but uh, it's still a bit of a pain in the backside. Uh, what else we've got here? It's not a question, but it's, an inter it's a point that is, is a good one. James Hawkins says, I imagine Conte giving long answers limits the number of questions that can be made and thus controlling the message that comes out of press conferences. I don't know if it's to do with that. I think it just likes to expand on stuff and, and talk. But yeah, I do think it will limit the number of questions. I think we'll probably be one each. And I think fans are going to get a bit annoyed. At, oh, why didn't you ask that? And I think it will be, we didn't get time. Um, 
Aidan Carlin says, Alistair, what's the situation with Alfie Devine? We started to see him in cup games last season. He, of course, scored against Marine, but not heard anything about him this season. He didn't feature in pre-season. Does he have an injury, or is there another reason? For... I think he did have an injury early in the pre-season. The thing with Alfie as well is that he is at the stage where he hasn't been, hadn't been at the club, I think it was the two years, so he couldn't be registered for European competition like just on the B list. So someone would have had to come out of the squad for him to be in. And like I say, they're, they're on the limit. So that's why he hasn't been involved in European games. But I think from... I think it'll be from next season. I'm trying to think if it's from January or not. But I think it's from next season he'll be able to involve. And I think you'll see a lot more of him. He's been, he's been doing fine. I think he's been playing... Under 18 games, I think he's been playing a few under 23 games as well. Um, he's so young. He's so young. He's incredible talent. And it's just about bringing him on at the right pace now and the right time and, and bringing him back into it. You know, he does play in an area where Spurs obviously had quite a lot of bodies in that central midfield, attacking midfield area as well. So every time you get a new manager, they're going to pretty much look at the senior players first. And, you know, Alfie is still very... I think, he, is he still 16? I'm trying to think if he's turned 17 yet. I think he may still even be 16. So it's their job, really, to look at what they've got first. And then as they get their feet under the table, they will look at other players. You know, with someone like Dane Scarlett, it was a bit different because Nuno would have come into the squad um, club and been told, look, this kid is going to be terrific. Um, he's already been promised to be involved in first team develop, um, training by Jose Mourinho. So... We'd like you to continue that, and, and you know, and he raved about him. And, and but we've seen with Dane as well. You know, it's all part of a long process, isn't it, with these young players as well. And I'd be intrigued to see kind of what Conte does with Dane Scarlett as well, and, and whether he plays in things like um, I don't know. Let's say the FA Cup third round. This is the thing now. The opportunities in Europe are kind of going or pretty much almost gone. Um, which I think maybe maybe opportunities in the last couple of games, I guess, for Dane. Uh, but yeah, with Alfie, I just think you know we shouldn't probably rush them. That's, I, I like everyone get very excited about these young, talented, wonder kid types that come through. But ultimately, it's still about bringing them through at the right pace. Um, there's another one. Right, okay. <laughs> K Fabe Fab F A B E asks. Um, to follow on, if you could go on a night out with two Spurs players, one past and one present, who would they be and why? Um, one past. Oh, it's gonna. Oh, it's gonna say Gaza, but actually I don't want him to drink, so I'm not going to say Gaza. Cause he would be awesome, um, but I don't want him out there drinking. Um, I would pick. Oh, because it's probably going to go for my kind of hero. My heroes as a kid were Gary Lineker and then Teddy Sheringham. I was a bit of a striker myself. So they were my two heroes. So I'd probably pick um, probably pick Gary Lineker because he also looks like he might be quite amusing off camera. Um, present, I would go for... Let's have a drink with... That's a, that's a good question out of the current squad. Um, I'm going to forget someone really obvious. I don't think he'd want to go out for a drink, but I think having uh, going out for a laugh with Sonny would be fantastic. You know, I've been very fortunate enough to interview him a couple of times. He is a great laugh. He's a very funny guy. What you see is what you get. Infectious smile that makes everyone want to laugh. Um, so, yeah, let's go for Lineker and Sonny. I think that would be interesting. Um... Richard Lees asks, have you ever watched Ben Foster's cycling goalkeeper, it's cycling GK YouTube channel? And assuming you know what it is, do you think we'll see a lot more behind the scenes type of footage from players and clubs like ones and documentaries? It seems to be a growing market. I have what I watched Ben Foster's one where he interviewed Danny Rose when he first came uh, to Watford. And yeah, no, it's a really, really good channel. It's really good. Um, I don't think we'll probably see, I think that's something he does very well. I don't think many players probably will do that. I think the insight that you'll get into stuff like that is probably when they do Instagram lives and Twitch and things like that when they're playing computer games. Amazon documentaries, clearly, there's a lot of those. You know, you only have to go on Amazon to see how many all of nothings there are. It was something that I think started with the NFL. You know, you obviously get hard knocks and stuff like that over there. 
Um, I think it's probably something that there has been and will continue to be, um, but how much access they get is another thing. I think, is it Arsenal next? I think they're, they're doing it this season with Amazon. So it would be interesting. I'd, they'd struggle to get the amount of stuff that went on with Spurs. Um, what else we got? More questions. There you go. There's one for... I thought the Skippy question might come up. Jeff Stevens, what with Hoybier injured... Maybe I don't think I, I think he might be back, but again we'll have to see. And Skippy suspended for the next league match. What are the alternatives? Our midfield against Leeds needs to be very strong and solid. Well, obviously both out. You get Harry Winks would come in. Um, there's no no shock about that. And he'll have had two weeks to work with Conte. I think he came on and did well against Vitesse from what I saw. Um, obviously a very different game to Leeds. Clearly, it's an interesting one. If, Sk- if Hoybier's fit and Skippy's out, then the choices are either you play Winks alongside Hoybier and you keep with the 3-4-3, three, three, maybe, or 3-4-1-2. Um, and then you play, say, Ondembele in front as in the number 10 role, let's go for. Uh, or you play Ondembele alongside Hoybier, um, and then that allows you to maybe play with the 3. That maybe opens up the 3-4-3 three, three, if you've got Ondembele playing alongside Hoybier. Um, or... Lascelles and Ondebele both play. Um, like you say, I agree. The, the midfield has absolutely got to be on it. They've got to be physically ready for it against Leeds. You're gonna, it's gonna be a fast-paced match. If Conte's got them up to speed, um, and as I said before, the international players that have gone off have been given individual training sh- schedules to do after their training sessions to try and increase their fitness. The ones who are at Hotspur Way have had like a boot camp, a mini preseason of sorts. So fitness-wise, they'll be much better. But we know what Leeds' fitness levels are like. So. You know, Spurs, I remember, was it 3-0 last season at the Spurs Stadium against Leeds? Leeds didn't really deserve to be 3-0 down. They'd kind of played quite well, um, but Spurs were just clinical. Um, if Spurs can get back to being that way, then they can pick them off. But Leeds are going to be tough. They are. Um, so, yeah, I think it could be any of those combinations, really, in that midfield. Um, what else we got here? Sharath asks, what are your thoughts on what would constitute success for Conte Spurs and where will we stand should it prove to still not happen? I think success for Conte Spurs for Spurs would be getting back into the top four and winning a trophy or two. Um, that you know, I just think we're at that stage now where trophies, if he can do that, he'll be a hero. Um, I think getting in the top four clearly would be huge for the club again. Um, in terms of if it doesn't, where we stand, if it does not happen, I think I said this in the last video, I think all eyes will be on the top. They'll be on Daniel Levy and they'll be on the fact that you brought in, you had Pochettino, one of the most kind of highly rated coaches in Europe. You had Jose Mourinho, who's probably won more than any other manager. You then went for Nuno, who, you know, has, did good things with Wolves. And then you've gone for Antonio Conte, who is probably the up there with the best managers in the world right now. If they all can't win stuff with Tottenham, then you have to look at the bigger picture massively and see kind of why why that's the case, what's the issue, and is the issue come from above. So we shall see. Um, that's not a question. Sven524 says, Do please let us know whether Paratici and Hitchin are as animated sitting behind Conte in the Leeds game as they were behind Nuno. I will. I will. That's not really a question, is it? But uh, I will. I'd be intrigued to see whether they're still there or not, whether he wants them there or not. I mean, technically, as I explained before, it's due to COVID protocol that they're there because they're in the red zone. They mix with the players anyway, so they have to be then sat amongst them. Otherwise, you're going out of the bubble, in the bubble, all this sort of stuff. And yes, I know people then go into their normal life, so there's a lot of contradictory rules when it's stuff like that. Um, But yeah, I, I shall. I shall let you know. Um, Lula Lafol asks Lulu Lafol asks which players do you think Conte will improve enough to bring them from the reserves into the first team and which ones do you think will suffer and potentially be sold on oh that's a terrible it's not really reserves anymore is it it's, unless this is what I'm not sure whether this question means the under 23 is a development squad or whether you mean the fringe players I think maybe you mean the fringe players here if you don't I apologise Lulu um in terms of, it's interesting, I mean, like, 
I personally, I think, apart from a rash moment early in, was it the Vitesse game? I think Ben Davies has looked quite good in this kind of left-sided side of the back three role, which he does play for Wales a fair bit. Uh, so, you know, he may get more out of him. Um, other two players that may be considered fringe players, Joe Roden. You know, if he gets a bit of a work with Joe Roden and actually gives him a chance, I think very much he could be a player that you could see come through. Same with Jaffet and Ganga. Um, I don't think who else is fringe. I suppose you're looking at the Harry Winks and Deli Alleys at the moment who, are, who have become fringe players and... It's like I say, I think this fortnight has been crucial for both of them. I'm really intrigued to see how we come out of this fortnight and in terms of what he feels about those two players. Um, there's not really too many other fringe players, is there, at Tottenham? Kind of everyone's needed. Um, what else we got? Jamie Cooksey asks, Who is your favourite cult hero at Spurs? For me, it's either Ben Wire, Suakoto, or Roman Pavlichenko. You've named one of them. I, I, Pavlichenko was one I used to really like. Um, I think he was a lot better than actually he was given credit for. Scored some lovely goals, lovely technique, but just yeah, it never kind of he wasn't around for too long. Um, but no, I always liked Super Pav. I thought he was um, again as a striker. He was someone that I used to like watch him play. I wouldn't say he kind of fully, fully adapted to the, the Premier League and English football, but I think he did some good nights, you know, um, Inter Milan, of course, scoring as well. Everyone remembers Bale, but it was, you remember also Pavlichenko putting the ball in the net and stuff. Um, this is a question, all oh, that's got exclamation marks. Matt T, please, please tell us the Bale rumour is fake. Um, yeah, I mean, from what I understand, it's... Currently, it's not something Spurs are looking at. He is... I don't really... You know, I'd love to have him bail back. And scoring 16 goals showed what he could do. But I just think in the Conte system, with the pressing, with the um, high demands that he has in terms of the fitness and constant movement for 95, 96 minutes on a pitch, I don't think it suits Bale. The pressing that would be required constantly as well. And, and the fact that he, he is kind of more of an out-and-out -out winger. Um, yeah, I... I can't see it myself, but hey, I did say this last summer. Um, I said, everyone says I, I said that he wasn't coming back. No, technically what I said, every previous season I said he wouldn't come back. What I said last summer was the only way he'd come back is if Real Madrid paid half, like, most of his wages and uh, it was a loan. And that was exactly what happened. But hey. People only remember some of the things you say, not all of them. Or they see only some of the things you say. But I'm not going into that whingy territory. Um, who else we got? Joel H asked, do you think any of the academy keepers can break through into the first team in the next couple of years? We seem to have quite a few with Whiteman getting minutes on loan and Brandon Austin being involved around the first team. Um, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. Obviously, Galini um, has been brought in to potentially be the Hugo Laurie successor. Um, I think personally, you do look to keep a Whiteman or an Austin as your third choice keeper because homegrown wise, it's good and I think it's just good for a club to see there's a pathway for the academy goalkeepers to come through. Um, it's all about patience, though. You know, Brandon Austin being England under 21 involvement in a few of the squads, he'll want to play football. You know, he played for Orlando City on loan. Um, Alfie Whiteman says is it Degger Fours in Sweden at the moment I've killed probably the pronunciation of that I think as long as you could almost rotate them couldn't you just each one gets a different loan each season and the other one gets to be the third keeper but I don't know how doable that is um, I think it'd be a bit of an ask for them to push through to be the top choice keeper but who knows if you get a chance and you take it who knows um and Sab Latif asks, can someone explain to me what is Ryan Mason's role? What is he supposed to do as a first team coach? Coach the first team. Um, there's not really much more to it. You know, I understand that, you know, Conte personally requested Ryan Mason. Uh, he came in and, and he was really impressed with him um, in those early training sessions as well when he was observing. Um, and uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's great for Ryan Mason. I, I've probably spoke about this, I think, a fair bit in the last video, so I'm not going to go down. I'll try and get some more questions in. But ultimately, he will learn so much from Conte, and Conte will hopefully pass on a lot to him. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for Ryan Mason. It really is. Um, someone moaning about players not giving their all. Uh, Mario Bari asks, what is your opinion on the attitude of many of our players? It seems they are in a comfort zone with great facilities and just not interested in pushing themselves to the next level. Antonio Conte is here. I don't need to say any more on that because they are not going to get the opportunity to be in a comfort zone. Um, the Shog asks, how was Lisbon? I can't do that on this video. I'd be wasting the question, but it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. I love the place. Um... That's not a question. Oh, Lebon Mon Monaskisi Monas M O N A K H I S I. So, uh, however that's pronounced. Um, which was the worst of our last two Portuguese failings? People say Jose was not back, but Jose said he rated that summer window a nine out of ten. Whereas Nuno was not allowed to play the formation he made his name using. Ah, oh, tough one. I say unfortunately, it probably has to be Nuno because he only lasted. Four three, four months. I think it has to be. Whereas Jose, you know, different people got different opinions on him. Um, I do wonder if he got that centre-back he really wanted, whether it would have been a different kind of outcome to that season. Um, and he had a lot of tough stuff to deal with in his first season. Football wasn't great. I do think Son and Kane helped him out a lot with the individual moments of magic. But no, I'd probably, I think it'd have to be Nuno out of the two. And like I say, I, I do wonder if Jose had had that centre-back that he wanted, whether that would have made a difference. Um, how long have we got? Right, I've got to fit a few more in, and then I'm going to have to head off. Um, oh, crikey. Brandon Price asks, what was your journey into sports journalism and then on to covering Tottenham? I'm going to do this really quickly because I may, I think I've done this before in Q&As. So essentially, started off as a news journalist um, in a local local newspaper covering all kinds of stuff you cover as a local news journalist you know you could be covering a murder one week you could be going to court to cover various awful things and incredibly interesting things you could be covering charity tea parties for the churches and old ladies tea parties and stuff and i'll always say this i know a lot of people nowadays in sports journalists just want to go bang straight into sports journalism they don't want to do anything else and i get it i get the impatience of just i want to write about football but for me, I'd say the four, four and a half years I spent as a news journalist absolutely gave me the grounding to not only have structure in my stories, understand angles, intros, everything to it, um, and also how to interview people and interview people in sometimes the most difficult situations. You know, I had to interview people. Oh, you know, I, did, I remember going into someone's house that was kind of almost burnt down and having to interview the people inside their house. I've had to interview people that have just lost um you know, loved ones, whatever age. Um, I've had to yeah, talk to people outside court when they've just had a been sentenced. They throw you into some very unpleasant situations. And I think when you've had the experience of doing all of that, writing about football without being blasé or patronising, you realise you put it in context, I think. Um, and I think it's a really good grounding for you. Um, but then after that, became a local sports reporter, uh, Covered a lot of the Hertfordshire and Essex area, covering various teams in every sport. Then kind of went up the levels, became a deputy sports editor, then a sports editor. Then I was a group sports editor. I was in charge of loads of different titles and uh, was subbing pages, designing pages as well. I was doing a bit of everything and getting all these pa papers out to print. Um, and then um, I convinced the powers that be that we should start covering Tottenham in one of our papers uh, well, online in the Hertfordshire Mercury's website because their training ground at Hotspur Way fell within our patch. Um, I did that. I only was doing that for about four months and the powers that be liked what I'd done and decided as they were creating this new website called football.london to ask me if I wanted to come across and cover Spurs. And the rest, as they say, is history. And I've been doing that now since January, covering Spurs since August 2016, technically in my current job are doing it full time without doing any of the other stuff I was doing with the newspapers since January 2017 so 
Yeah, we're at the uh, we've passed the half a decade now covering Spurs, which is uh, it's flown by. It's because so much has happened. Um, so yeah, that's it really. Um, loads of I always get loads and loads of people asking me about journalism advice. I'm always happy to answer it. Um, I think I always feel that's kind of my duty as a, as an older journalist to try and help you know those trying to get into the industry now because it's even more saturated right now than it was when I started all those years ago. Gosh, 2003 I became a journalist. There you go. There's, there's, that makes me feel old. Um, and yeah, and there's, there's so much to it now. There's probably more avenues to write now than there were when I started, but that only makes it more difficult to kind of get noticed and, and, and make sure your stuff is, is the stuff that people are reading. Um, right, what else have we got? Maybe we've got time for one more. Let's have a look. Keith Hedges, do you think Spurs could go back in for Triore at Wolves? He'd be a very strong wing back, could offload surplus right. I kind of got the feeling that was a new no want. Um, I think Paratici liked him as well. Um, again, I would say it's less likely than it was under Nuno, but you never know. Conte might go, yes, please. Um, done that one. Sean Kim says, hello. I say, every time you go on vacation, something great happens to Spurs. Could you go for a long, long vacation? Oh, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I appreciate that that's the thing now. If I was given a pound for every time someone uh, says, can you go away for the January transfer window? I would be so rich. I would be so rich. What I would say is that it's actually, it's actually not every time I go away that stuff happens. There are notable ones, quite clearly, <laughs> as has been proved. Uh, but it's quite a few times when I'll have a few days off and absolutely nothing happens. But I don't always tell you that I'm having days off. I've had some people saying I take loads of days off. What I do, and I think this is maybe why I get that perception, is that I don't take a lot of days off in the first, second half of the football season. So there's all the business end of stuff. I don't really take a lot of time off then at all. And often in the summer, I won't take loads off because of the, you know, you got all the transfer stuff and things like that. Um, so I end up, all my holidays end up bunching in the first half of the season quite a lot. A little bit in the summer. Maybe it maybe take two weeks in the summer. But yeah, and the rest kind of bunch up towards the end. So it looks like I'm having a holiday like every other month or something. But it's just because I haven't taken them in the first month of the year. Uh, well, let's try and squeeze in one more. I want to get this under an hour. Um, okay, let's... Yeah, let's go for this one. Uh, Joe asks, my question is, do you see Jaffet Tenganga playing a role in the Conte system, possibly at centre-back or still as a backup right-back? I can't see him as a wing-back, so I think on the right of the back three, I think he could be brilliant. I really do. I like Jaffet a lot. Um, he's had his troubles with injuries, which I think has always interrupted his rhythm. I think if he gets opportunities on the right of that back three, I think he might convince um, Conte that he's the future there. He, he really, he's so adaptable. Um, a bit like Ben Davies on the other side, but I'd say more he's a natural centre-back, Tanganga. So to be able to do that, but also get up the pitch, because if you notice that against the Everton game, Davies was getting up the pitch as well. And I think with Tanganga, you could get him to do that as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, th I think Tanganga really, really could fit in. Oliver Marsden asked, did you go to Sintra? I did. It was beautiful. Uh, I was trying to squeeze in one last one. Uh, Owen Reaper Review says, Will Mark and Day, Dylan Mark and Day get game time under Conte in the early stage of the FA Cup, maybe or in the Conference League? Um, well, obviously, he's already made his debut in the Conference League. I hope so. I hope so. He's had an incredible 12 months or so, um, Dylan Mark and Day. And I think then to make his Premier League, uh, sorry, Premier League debut, his Tottenham debut was fantastic. I think, yeah, I, I, it, it depends what they do now in these, is it two games less, isn't it, in the group? Um, and then, um, and then the FA Cup. It depends if they draw in the FA Cup as well. There's so many variables. I'd love to see Dylan get more game time. And then or maybe even loan him out in January. I think it could really be the making of him. Uh, I think he's such a good young player. But he's just in a position at the moment at Spurs that's a little bit cluttered. Um, so let's see. Right, I'm going to head off there. Thank you for all your questions. They were fantastic, honestly. And there was even more I could have done. Um... I'm going to enjoy the rest of the international break now. Ugh. And then we'll... Um, but we'll be back soon. We'll have hopefully Antonio Conte press conference on Friday. Um, probably Friday. Sunday, Leeds. Then I'm heading out to Slovenia for the Mura game as well. So that'll be 
fascinating and just looking forward to experiencing what the whole Conte press conference stuff is like and just meeting the guy and, and asking him stuff. So we shall see. Right, but I'm going to head off there. As always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and uh, I shall catch you later. Goodbye. <laughs>